Right. So uh, yeah, planning for overload. Uh, this is a topic I think is fairly important in whatever system we design, but often forget about. So uh, I'd like everyone to raise their hands up just for beginning that one. Just raise one hand up if you want, please. All right. So if you've ever had the error, no, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. <laughs> if you've ever had the error logger blowing up, you can take your hand down. If you've ever had uh, blocking operations that were backing up, either writing to a database or to a socket, you can take your hand down also. If you've ever had a message queue that explodes, you can take your hand down. I see no hand left up. All right, so everyone has had issues with overload, and pretty much everyone has seen that eheap lock cannot allocate blah, 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 bytes of memory in the whole heap message before, which happens whenever you run out of memory. Uh, the way to see the system in that way, uh, I like to compare it to a bathroom sink. Usually in informal discussions, I use a toilet, uh, but that's, yeah. Uh, bathroom sink is a bit nicer for the kind of data you push through it. So uh, you always start at the edge of the system where the input comes in, and you go deeper and deeper in the system until you get the output. And the output here is something down at the drain. So in normal operations, you will have a bit of data coming in. The data will come out at roughly the same time. Everything is fine. Everybody is happy. You can brush your teeth, spit in the drain, whatever. It's going to be fine. From time to time, you get temporary overload. Maybe two people are putting water at the same time in the system, or maybe just more usage and whatever. And usually, it's fine. You're going to have the sink accumulate water in it. You're going to have your system accumulate stuff in buffers and memory. And after a while, uh, it's going to subside. And when it goes, uh, the drains will quickly empty up, and then regular operation can follow. So you're able to deal with a bit of overflow temporarily. The problem comes when you have prolonged overload. So when the overload keeps going and going, and maybe you're popular, maybe you're WhatsApp, and you just got bought for $19 billion, and more people are using your application than before. Uh, when that kind of stuff happens, uh, there is a breaking point at which the system can no longer cope uh, with whatever is going on. So yeah, it is going to get full and full and full, and you're very happy about it. And then all of a sudden, you've got a crash dump. Everything is spilling on the floor. Your system is dying. So yeah, uh, that's overload for you in a very, very short manner. So what do we do when we see that kind of message, the one with a crash dump and stuff going very bad? Uh, the first reaction, usually, I guess, is to raise your limit. Uh, it took too much memory, so just, just give it more memory. I guess it's going to solve the problem, right? If we make it bigger, it's going to work. It's science. What could be wrong with that? <laughs> so you run it that way, and then a couple of weeks later, when it had the time to gather more data in its temporary overflow, it dies again. So then you start going, and say, yeah, well, too much memory. And then you look at the process queues and the process heaps, and you see that, oh, something at the edge of the system uh, basically is taking too much memory. So let's optimize now. So you start taking the edge of the system, and you say, hmm, looks like the buffers are getting full. And ULimit didn't help it, so let's make bigger buffers. So you build a bigger buffer, then you wait two or three weeks, you put it in production, and eventually it crashes again. So you look at the new crash dump and say, yeah, the buffers are big, so clearly they're not the problem. And you start looking at the drains at the bottom of the buffers, and you say, yeah, well, maybe it's time to optimize that. So you spend a couple of days or maybe a couple of weeks optimizing them away, then you have this fantastic new system in production that's now much better than it was before. You let it run for two or three weeks, and it crashes again. So you start looking at it and say, well, it looks like the drains are actually emptying its still tiny pipes. So you spend a lot of time optimizing that one, and that's where you do the hardcore optimizations, and you get the profiler out, and you shave milliseconds out of everywhere. And so you deploy this kind of hulk of a system that's terribly ugly, <laughs> not elegant. But it runs kind of fine. So you have, yeah, super big pipes and everything, and you can brush your teeth forever without a problem. <laughs> uh, eventually, uh, you let it run, and it runs two months without a problem. It's fine. You're a genius. And then it crashes again. Then you look at it, and you say, oh, yeah, there's this kind of drain at the bottom that I don't control. This is actually going to sewer system, and I don't have the means to fix that. So what's the conclusion about that is that I got paid to, fill, to solve the wrong problem. So uh, yeah, for all that time, we've spent weeks and weeks and months and lots of time and company money uh, to fix a problem that actually, if we studied the system a bit, would have seen the drain at the bottom. And this is the kind of overflow or overload that we cannot cope with. This is something external to our system. Uh, if you're working in the real world, that might be an API to an external system from a different company. 
And as much as it would be fun to storm into their offices and kick down the Ruby walls and install Erlang in there to make it work faster, you just can't. Uh, you have, uh, yeah, sometimes at the disk, the disk getting too full, the disk is not fast enough, and you could change hardware. Might be a bit uh, costly. It could be uh, the bandwidth you have in your system. There is something at some point that gets output from your system. Otherwise, you're writing dev null in a very complex way. And whatever gets out from your system has a rate or maximal rate at which it can be consumed. At some point, it might even be the maximal rate at which humans could consume the data at some point. So yeah, if you don't want to be paid to solve the wrong problem, overload must be planned for. And it's absolutely important that overload is planned for because it defines how you die. And given how many people uh, lower their hands at the beginning of the talk, it also defi def uh, defines how often you die. Uh, now, it won't cover all the cases you die because hardware failures are still going to give you uh, very inelegant failures. But a lot of them can be blocked or planned for or, well, just prevented by planning for overload. It defines premature optimization. And basically, the entire process with the drain I mentioned uh, is premature optimization. And we have developers or engineers often have the uh, idea that you need to measure before optimizing. And in that case, we even measured. We had symptoms. We had drains. We had buffers that were full. We have mailboxes that get filled. And we optimized them away, but we just measured the wrong, the wrong thing. We measured where the problem was happening, but never took into consideration the uh, internal limits of the system that we cannot modify. And each system has that kind of limit at some point, uh, past which it's not worth optimizing. You have to grow it in a different way compress your data or whatever you can do. But there is a hard limit given by hardware or how many nodes you have or something like that that you cannot go past. And if you don't find that point first, every optimization you're going to be doing is going to be done for nothing and for a lot of money, which is kind of fun for your resume, but it's kind of bad for your employer. Uh, it defines your margin of error. And the margin of error that we have when we operate a system in production I like to see it like a kind of a uh, balloon that you keep inflating. So when you blow a balloon, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And at some point when you blow in it, there's a pressure coming back, and you feel that it's about to explode. So you just stop there, tie the nut, then keep it there. And you look, and the next balloons you blow, you blow them roughly the same size. And at some point you figure out that, oh, you can make it maybe a centimeter or a, a, an inch bigger in diameter and it won't blow up. So that becomes a new margin of error. And the margin of error is that buffer space between where you're at right now and when the balloon explodes in your face or in the face of a children at a party, <laughs> which you kind of want to avoid a bit more. Uh, so yeah, as you go, uh, you blow it more and more and more and more. And at some point, the margin of error is going to be razor thin. And if you're running anywhere close to a cloud, uh, storms are frequent, and it's not only things you control that restrict the margin of error. Uh, running in the cloud is sometimes blowing a balloon in a room full of needles. And sooner or later, it's going to blow the balloon up in your face, even if it were safe for three months and you change nothing, and it's still the same volume. So it's important to define the margin of error, because if you plan for overload, you're able to fix that margin of error in a way that's always safe and lets you detect problems before they crash systems entirely. It defines your API. Uh, and to define the API, I want to come back on this a bit later. Uh, just keep it in mind that your API will be impacted by how you plan for overload, no matter what you, what you want to do. And if you don't plan for overload, uh, when you do your first API, and then you figure out that you need to do it later, you need to change your API. And that's not simple if you have customers that depend on your API, and then they build their code according to it, and you end up changing the semantics of it, not just the way the calls are made, you're just going to piss off a lot of people and probably won't be able to get people to migrate there and won't be able to handle overload ever. So you ne really, really need to plan for it. And in general, it defines what is engineering in your team. Uh, all these tasks, figuring out how to die, figuring out uh, optimization, figuring out what's your margin of error, figuring out how you expose data to people, that's engineering. So if you're doing engineering, overload is something you want to care about. You have to pick what has to give. Uh, ideally, all the systems we develop are the perfect system that keep accepting all the data in the world forever with no pressure and keep churning out good results all the time with no pressure. In reality, that doesn't exist. 
And it's similar to uh, databases with the CAT theorem. In the CAT theorem, you have to pick between consistency and availability to different degrees. You cannot have both uh, while tolerating partitions. Uh, for overload, you have to pick between blocking an input, which is back pressure, or shedding load, which is dropping data on the floor. So back pressure uh, is a bit like having a bouncer in a nightclub that just keeps people out. It decides that to be safe, you can have this many people inside, and they have to look good or something like that. Uh, for dropping data on the floor, actually, if you look at a hydroelectric dam, they have a spillway, which is usually something a bit lower in the dam, but on the sides that lets overflow water just go around. You don't need it to produce that much electricity, and it keeps the dam from breaking and killing everybody in town. It's just kind of useful, if you like the people in town. Uh, so yeah, in the end, it's a business decision. And this is something that's kind of boring to see in engineering. You, don't, you just want to work on hard problems and solve hard problems and be a hero in IRC or something like that. Uh, but it's a business decision. And ultimately, uh, whether you can pick on blocking user input or dropping data on the floor will depend on the kind of problems you're trying to solve and what your customers are, are allowed to do. People working in advertising are more often than not able to drop data on the floor less than blocking input. Whereas people doing uh, e-commerce websites have more options to block input than shedding load, for example. So for back pressure, uh, the most basic form is simple back pressure. And simple back, back pressure is something that if you work with Ruby, Python, uh, even Java and other languages that are mostly uh, sequential, is implicit all the time. You call a function from a given place, and then it just blocks until it gets a result all the time. You have a restricted number of pools because otherwise it's too expensive. So whatever kind of input you do, the back pressure is implicit. And on these systems, whenever it gets overloaded, uh, you will rarely see the node explode in the dying fire. What you will see is a bunch of customers telling you, the website is kind of slow. What's the problem with the website? My P99 is really bad. And th that's going to be because of the back pressure is going back to the TCP socket, and then they see the back pressure up to their own application, which might be their browsers. And you need to do it all the way down. In languages like Erlang or Node.js and JavaScript, you don't have that. You have that kind of systems where everybody takes a server, puts all the settings to the highest maximum possible. And then you get a billion requests accepted, caught in the memory heather of your node. And then you have the little database at the end that has to chug through everything. And you just keep piling it up and up and up and up all the time if you don't do uh, any kind of back pressure whatsoever. So, in Node.js, there is absolutely no way to do that kind of implicit back pressure, because if you do, you just block the entire server for everyone at once. In Erlang, you can do it implicitly by using functions like genServerCall, uh, the equivalent to uh, GenFSM or whatever. When you do a call, you will block on the response that you're waiting for, uh, from for the process. And if you do it all the way down, you can restrict the number of callers at the edge of the system. So that may mean you can accept at most 100 country requests. And you're going to have back pressure implicitly built in your system that way. So that's going to be a way to automate it. And it's going to slow the users down. And yeah, the problem with slowing the users down is that, well, it's kind of like the back pressure mechanism. If the back pressure mechanism is implicit, there's no explicit way to explain to users who are the, why they're getting the back pressure, right? And there is a fun issue in our line, which is the timeout management. So if I have uh, the, edge of my, the edge of my system right there, and I put a five seconds delay, and then I have the next step there, and I put another five seconds delay maximum, and I have the deep in the system, there's still a five seconds delay. Even if that one takes 4.5 seconds to execute, if I took one second to get from there to there, uh, I'm going to fail and explode on the edge because the timeout will be there, even if none of the other timeouts actually failed. So when you go on the airline mailing list and you ask, what do I do about these cases? How do I pick timers? Uh, you have a bunch of people telling you, well, put the timer to infinity. Problem solved. Uh, the problem with that, and I, I want to quote Pat Helen on that one, is some application developers may push for no timeout and argue that it's OK to wait indefinitely. I typically propose they set the timeout to 30 years instead. Then the developers kind of react, and why 30 years? 30 years is kind of ridiculous. And then I ask, why is 30 years silly, but infinity reasonable? And now every time I put a timeout somewhere, I say, is 30 years reasonable? And if I say no, usually I want to say, well, maybe 15 seconds is enough to kill after a while, right? 
So yeah, uh, putting time out to infinity is kind of a non-decision. It's just not taking a decision. You're pushing it until later, and you're basically making sure that the behavior remains undefined, which is not something you want to do when you want to plan for overload. If you leave it undefined, you're not planning. You're just shoving it under the rug. So yeah, put a timeout. And usually, you want the timers at the edge to be bigger, bigger than, the time or the, than the timeouts deep inside the system. Now, something you may want to do is say, well, every request I want to do will take 15 seconds maximum because 30 years was too long. And everything past that can be set to infinity because the timer at the edge is taking care of the rest. So if you do that, you basically have one big timer and the rest has back pressure for no very good reason. So what's interesting is getting into an explicit form of back pressure, which is asking for permission. Uh, for that to be done, you need to really know what your bottleneck is, like your real, real system bottleneck, not just the one that you put incidentally because we're all bad programmers deep down. Uh, you have to figure out the, the part at the end and decide, is it OK if I send you more data? And if it's OK, I'm going to push more water down the drain. If it's not OK, I won't. The little problem we can get uh, into with that is that if you really, really put your, your, your sensor or your probe or your permission asking at the bottleneck itself, you're going to have this kind of on and off effect all the time that's just going to be wobbly. Because the time that the edge of the system makes it to the bottom, there's a delay there where you're just going to accept a crap load of requests. Then you're going to deny them for a while. Then you're going to accept more. It's just going to go off on and off and off and off and off like that. It's going to be pretty bad. So what people do in these cases usually is that you just set a buffer. And the buffer in that case is just a pipe. You ask a bit higher there. Is it OK? Are you being overflowed at the limit of that buffer? And then it empties up a bit, gets a bit fuller, and something like that. And the buffer will basically make sure that you get better utilization of the system. So that's a lot of stuff without any kind of code. There's not going to be more code than that. But I'm going to point it out to code if you really want to see it. So if you want to implement that kind of explicit back pressure mechanism, uh, you can use it with processes in the net stable. Uh, you use it to ask for permission, and then you need to do the app for your own system and solution you invented. It's doable. It might be super flexible. Um, but there are things that exist already. So if you're blocking on memory, there's MemSOP in OSMON that ship with OTP. If you're blocking on CPU, CPU SOP with OSMON and OTP. Disk SOP is actually about total disk space. So this is something you may want to do. And when you're doing explicit back, back pressure, it's possible you have more than one bottleneck, depending on the circumstances. So it's possible before accepting a request or deciding to service it that you ask for more than one of these, whether you can or not. There's the overload module in uh, SASL. I don't particularly like that one personally because it has a kind of a fancy calculation about send rate and whatnot that I'm not the biggest fan of, but might be interesting. In the open source community, uh, we have Old Vigor who wrote the job system that was made to control at the edge of the system that kind of back pressure mechanism. Uh, Jay Lewis, Jesper Lewis Anderson from Erlang Solutions, looked at that system, tried to, to test it, found a bunch of bugs, and wrote Safety Valve. And Safety Valve do does that kind of management where you have the buffer you want, the kind of overload you want. You can pick your dropping strategy, and it's going to tell you if it's too busy or not. So if you have to do back pressure control on your Erlang system, and you will have to do either back pressure or load shedding, Safety Valve is something you should really, really look into uh, before you get started or before you get started on your second rewrite of the system, because the first one keeps crashing all the time. Right, load shedding. Or in other words, I don't even need these requests. Where are you giving them to me? Uh, load shedding is something that we don't see nearly as often uh, as the core business of the system, but we see from time to time in every system. Uh, one example for that, I think, are metrics, uh, some log messages, if they're info messages, if they're uh, warning messages. You may want to drop them during overload, but you don't want to drop error messages or critical messages, for example. Uh, so one of the first implementations you can have for uh, load shedding is random dropping. And random dropping is something you can implement as a receiver, uh, but it's kind of inefficient because it means you still have to, keep, to get all the data inside the system before throwing it on the floor. Random drop is really, really nice when you do it producer size. And that happens, uh, the best example I have is with metrics. When I, were, when I was working with um, advertisement stuff, you would get something like 10,000 requests a second per node. And each of these requests might be generating 50 log messages or 50 metrics uh, messages. 
And if you count, that gives you 10,000 times 50. That makes a shitload of requests just to get logs. And to some extent, your system is going to be more busy handling logs and handling metrics than it's going to be busy doing it truly its core business. So a random drop is not more complex uh, than these two functions. We have a module called, well, drop random, and random is the function there. It just gives you a given rate, and I want 95% of a request to be dropped. What you do with a random drop that's fairly neat is that if you're keeping only 5% of the requests at a volume, and this is something uh, Brian Troutwine treated a bit this morning, you get a large enough sample size that all your data is still relevant, but you literally only use a fraction of it. So if I'm keeping only 5% of my requests, I can multiply every value in the logs I have by 20 and get something that's fairly equivalent to the full size of everything. So random drop is something that's being used uh, in stats drill for logging in the metrics there. I think Folsom does it with some of its counter for some of its counters for sampling. And you can correct me that I think Exometer does something like that also. Yeah. Yeah, Exometer does something like that also. So all these metric critical systems are doing it. So if you're using one of these tools, you're doing load shedding already in, in parts of your systems. Another approach is a queue buffer. And a queue buffer is something that you can use, and random drop is something you can use also in back pressure. The difference between back pressure and load shedding when you use a buffer like that uh, is that in the case of back pressure, it tells you it can't take more data. In the case of load shedding, it drops data for you. So for a queue buffer, uh, you get more control in random drop. The messages will come on in the same order, and when the buffer is full, you have the choice of either dropping the messages that are the oldest or the newest. And uh, this is usually something that you have the choice of doing uh, entirely based on business rules you have. So for example, if you're having a card system, because card systems are the cornerstone of the internet, uh, if you're having a card system, you probably want to keep the oldest requests first. They were the first clients in line. Those are the ones you want to serve. Those that can't make it, you may shed them on the ground. It's not too bad. If you're dealing with logging or recent or current events or news, uh, at that point, it might be more interesting to drop the old messages and just keep serving the new ones. And a nice system for a load shedding will be able to give you the option of doing both. Um, yeah, the messages will be in order. But the problem we have with queue buffers, basically, is that if we have one of these uh, messages that takes long to process, the entire queue gets to slow down. And if all of them are a bit slower, the last message to come in will have all the buffering times of all the other messages in the queue uh, accumulated in there. Um, so you have stack buffers. And this is something I discussed in a talk uh, here in this exact same room two years ago, uh, telling you that I don't do a lot of new stuff or something for my talks. Uh, but yeah, stack buffers is something you do if you need to have better latency overall. So the difference with a stack and queue buffer is that you will always drop the newest request and you will always read from the newest request that's in. So when you have a few outliers that are very, very slow, only the requests that are already in the buffer are going to be accumulating time and having a bad service time. And if you're ready to drop the request, that's not a big deal because you could just clear the entire buffer and that would not be a big degradation of service. So you keep getting them uh, first and first all the time. That's better for low latency, uh, but that means that you cannot have ordering in the messages that you're receiving. If you need ordering, uh, stack buffers are basically out of the equations because you're going to read the message in a different order than what they come in. Implementations for that. Uh, oh yeah, lagger does it on OTP errors for cascading failures. So not the lagger, colon, message, or whatever. Those are actually. Uh, never dropped. But for OTP errors that happen if you crash big supervision trees, Lagger has a mechanism in place where it accepts a given number of messages per interval of time. And if it's higher than that, it will just drop whatever it receives until the interval ticks over. And then it will keep accepting them over and over again. So that's a form of load shedding that Lagger does. It's the form of load shedding I've put recently in Recon to do tracing uh, and kick the node when it's tracing too hard. So you can do that kind of stuff. Uh, there's a disk count application. That's the one I presented uh, roughly two years ago. And uh, the difference with disk count is that it's like a stack buffer, but the stack has a value of one in there. And what that gives you is basically the idea that if the request will be dropped, you know it instantly, uh, rather than maybe losing it. So it can be used both for back pressure and both for uh, load shedding, but in practice, it's more or less used for load shedding. <coughs> 
And then there's the application PO Box uh, that we developed at Heroku this year. Basically, PO Box is uh, a mailbox for your mailbox. And it's something that we extracted from the Logplex system we have uh, at Heroku. And basically, you have this process called the PO Box that a process starts. If you have a process that's really, really, really busy all the time and it keeps receiving messages in its mailbox, every time you do an operation that has to do with your business rules, you won't be shedding load. You'll be accumulating it, and that's what will cause your message queues to blow up and up and up in size until eventually the entire system dies. So um, the way to do that is to add more processes. And this is a bit of the uh, grandma's solution for Erlang. Uh, when something fails, just add more processes and wait until it works. So PO Box uh, gives you a new process that will only receive messages. It will store that stuff into a buffer that you have right here. And the buffer can be either a queue buffer that drops the newest, a queue buffer that drops the oldest messages, or a stack buffer. It does both of them. And if you don't touch the process, it just receives the message and drops them as they come around. All the time, it drops them and drops them and drops them. The process that does important stuff can tell PO Box, tell me whenever you get a new message. And you receive one notification that tells you you've got mail. You can call the process and it send me the mail. And to send the mail, you have a function that lets you filter and pick whatever is in the mailbox. That's a bit less powerful than a selective receive, uh, but does a civil, uh, similar work. The PO Box can then send a batch of messages and will report how many were lost. What's interesting with that loss of messages is that you can use that as a feedback loop somewhere in your system to say, I'm currently dropping message, so apply back pressure. It's possible to take hybrid approaches if you can afford it. And we'll see maybe how you can afford it when we discuss the APIs a bit. Um, so the way to work with PO Box is that, yeah, you have a filter function and you just sell it, you're now active and filter them. So this filter function right there is called with a state of 25. And what it does is basically send you 25 messages that are not empty binaries. Uh, whenever there's no message left, you, it, it returns skip. Skip basically tells PO Box that uh, I'm done with the current batch of selection. Returns all the message to you and keeps buffering with the rest of the mailbox intact. Drop and messages or something tells you to drop that message. I don't want it. You can just drop it right away. Go to the next one, but keep calling the filter function. And as the state doesn't change. And though the, the last one telling you, OK, that's a message I want, uh, will let you know basically that you want to receive the message in your process. Uh, decrease the counter. So that one, yes, will return 25 uh, messages that are not empty binaries. We use PO Box like that in production system at Heroku that have to do with output and logging. So when you're in the cloud, uh, everything likes to turn to mud from time to time for no really good reason. And whenever we're doing logging, it happened that, yeah, from time to time, the throughput of just doing I.O. format or just sending to a file or something like that would drop by as much as 50% for periods of three to six to seven hours for no reasonable reason, probably just noisy neighbors on the same hardware. So we move all our I.O. format calls and all our lagger logging calls to uh, an application called Batch.io. And Batch.io is basically P.O. Box with a process that just buffers all the messages we receive in batches of four kilobytes, which tends to fit very well into a given buffer window when you write to disk or something like that. And yeah. What it does is that it basically just has this gigantic buffer of 40,000 messages. Like I said, you, you don't necessarily want to set uh, a low limit. You just want to set any limit at all that's kind of reasonable in one crash of system. So 40,000 messages was perfectly fine for log messages to be backed up. It takes a lot of memory, but it doesn't kill the system. So we put it to 40,000. And uh, whenever it's full, it just drops messages until the IO system or the noisy neighbor eventually disappears or gets booted off the platform and then we're able to catch up. And we went from having maybe one crash every two months due to logging system getting backed up, uh, not counting the degradation of the system. Because if you're using IO format or lagger message or something, you're getting overflowed, uh, it becomes blocking, and all your operations, including logging, become slower. So basically, when these other replications will slow down the IO system, our logging that was there to debug stuff was actually causing bugs and bad performance in the system. That made it go entirely asynchronously, and uh, I haven't checked in months because it works fine, but after like two or three months over 45 to 100 nodes rolling over over time, I think only two of them needed to drop messages and had filled the buffer or to up to 40,000. The rest of them never used the entire buffer space, but we just raised throughput and made sure that we can never ever again crash due to 
logging taking over, and it's no longer ever going to be blocking us, uh, whatever operation we're doing, just because we saw that there was an overload in there and took measures to correct it. There is a very, very important question in all of that, is how do you tell users uh, about back pressure or load shedding? Because if you don't tell them, they just think that your system is kind of all wonky and for no reason, and they hate you, and then you get support calls at 3 in the morning, and it's urgent, and you have to take it, and it's kind of a sad story. So yeah, you can block on sessions for back pressure. If you ever go on Reddit, uh, this is what they tend to do when they're getting overloaded. Uh, they log you out, they put the site on read-only, and you basically have a degraded experience, but still an experience that can be had on the website. Uh, in some cases, when you have an API or a service, you can keep new people from starting a new session, or just throttle the rate at which you accept session, which forces the people to wait a bit and just slows down the operations of the system a bit. Uh, blocking sessions is not the most optimal thing. Uh, it's generally better to put usage limits however high. And these usage limits are both valid for load shedding or for back pressure. More often than not, though, we see them for uh, back pressure. And usage limits can be absolute for the node, which means I'm able to handle a thousand concurrent requests after which I'm blocking. Or they can be set by user. And by user is usually much, much nicer, because if you have an important customer, you can give them a limit that's twice the size of the usual customer, and they're going to be happy about it. And then you just found a way to make more money, because you're, city, you're, you're selling an upgraded service for some people. Everybody's going to love you and your company. Uh, the, the danger of limits being set by user is that if we go back to that margin of error we had in the balloon that's about to pop, the more users you have, um, the absolute limit you put on your system is also growing. It's a bit like ISPs uh, that love to sell more bandwidth that they're able to get on the system because they know that most people won't be bad citizens. And then uh, torrents come out, and Netflix comes out, and then they're really, really depressed because all of a sudden they're no longer able to deal with it. So yeah. You have to be careful when you set it by users so that the margin of error you define as the safe space to which your application can survive doesn't end up shifting past the actual safe point, at which point it's as if you had absolutely no overload planning at all. It just took time to implement it, and that's similar to having a bad premature optimization, right? So yeah, per user limits are fairly nice, uh, but you have to be very careful and consider them from time to time. Either you need to add capacity or you need to progressively reduce the limits on all users, which tends to piss them off. Uh, when you're doing load shedding, telling people about lost messages is actually fairly efficient. People are not that mad when you lose data if it's not vital data or their credit data or your baby is born, congratulations, then you lose the message. Uh, they're they're going to be fine with a few log messages disappearing, for example. And if you tell them, well, there was an overload, probably due to the fact that you're consuming too slowly or producing too much, people are usually fine with that explanation. And they're going to debug a bit and say, oh, yeah, that's kind of slow. I found a bottleneck there. They're going to make their application faster. And they're not going to call you. So Logplex has L10 messages that tell you the drain for the log messages you have right now was not fast enough. And we had to drop that many messages. And we let them know how many we dropped. Uh, if you're using different part of the system, that can be the same. Another important point is to respect the end-to-end -end principles. And this is more of a general tip than uh, something about overload planning. The end-to-end -end principles is something from the late 70s to the early 80s that led to uh, the TCP protocol, more or less. And we do it implicitly in Erlang when you talk from a process to another one. When you send a message, you don't get an OK telling you that the, uh, the function call or whatever operation you wanted to do succeeded. You need to do it manually and send a message back that you will receive that tells you, I actually did the work you wanted me to do. It's not something like I received a message you wanted me to receive and then I threw it on the ground, but you have no way to know. It's really about, I did the job you wanted me to do. Here's the result. An end-to-end -end principle like that uh, has to be respected in the APIs, especially when you have more than one item in the dependency chain. Something that will happen in Erlang if you're not careful is that you're going to send a message to one process and it's going to tell you, OK, I handled it. But then the actual work actually depends on another process, depends on that other one. And if you don't respect that final callback at the end, it tells you, yes, the absolute final task you wanted to do succeeded, um, you're kind of screwed. And what happens is that if you don't respect that and you shed load, there's no way for the user to know whether the operation worked or not. So they don't know if they can retry it or not. They don't know if retrying it will actually break something. So respecting the end-to-end -end principles is something you have to care about and make 
idempotent a APIs. And that's the point about APIs I wanted to make uh, earlier. So when you're shedding load or you're denying, well, when you're denying a request uh, due to back pressure, usually it's not a big deal. Uh, what will happen is that you will have to consider having an error message that tells you you're currently breaking the API rate limit that we gave you, uh, which is part of your, your API and you have to think about it. Uh, because something that's extremely sad is that if you put no limit on the API, then suddenly one day you put a limit on the API, all your customers are going to be fairly angry and think that you're screwing them over. <laughs> So ideally, you start with a limit right away because it's much, much easier to give more leeway to people than remove it from them without making them angry. Uh, in terms of indempotence, if you're using uh, load shedding as a mechanism and you're dropping requests on the ground, that's perfectly fine, but the client has to be able to make the request again and make sure that maybe it will be reapplied, maybe it will fail again. And being impotent basically means that if I made the request one time, it may or may not work. If I make it two times, the result will be the same as if I made it one time, finally. Basically, it's a guarantee that one or more time having the call being made won't make a difference with just having been being made once. And if you're dealing with a card system again, uh, that means doing something like every operation you do for buying some things or for reimbursing something has a transaction ID, for example. And that transaction ID is something that you put in the request and that lets someone try to delete the same item, uh, the same item 15 times if they want. And if it's been registered once, you say that transaction ID is already taken, actually your operation was successful. And that's fine. And if you don't think about that and making that part of your API, it's going to be very, very hard to retrofit that kind of stuff back in there. But that's actually essential to making something usable once you plan for overload. And if you don't plan for overload, you get crashes all the time and you have to do ops during the night. Questions? All right. Mm -hmm. Maybe just give them priority uh, access because uh, their processes just might be a little bit more important to drop things uh, from, you know, from our standpoint to be at all. Uh, currently, what we do, at least in the logging system that I manage, is that everyone is equal in these systems. And if you're generating more data, uh, you actually have to just drain it fast enough. What we found out is that most of the time, our system is actually fast enough to accommodate the biggest loads in the system. For example, in the logging system, uh, it's easily doable to do more than 50,000 uh, messages a second without a problem per user. And it's rare that someone will do more than that, except when maybe Ruby on Rails is crashing repeatedly and that's like a DDoS attack. Uh, usually people are fine with not receiving all the messages in that case. So in practice, we haven't had that need. But something we, ga we, we gave is that uh, we have a support team and we gave them a tool which is basically a dev null drain. So when people send messages on Heroku and Logplex, uh, you get a drain that tells you, that lets you reroute it to a given endpoint. And what we have is that kind of dev null endpoint that just spins through the messages as fast as possible, but still reports losses. So that lets customers know that given an optimal drain, this is what would happen. And usually that's, uh, that, that lets us know that they're possibly consuming data too slow, and that's what's causing the system to back up and forcing us to shed load. And when that doesn't happen, uh, it happens once and it was internally with a team, then we need to go around and optimize a bit. But so far, using that system that lets uh, our support team tell the customer, actually, the problem is on your end, we might optimize it, won't solve anything. Uh, it will just give the bigger buffer that eventually we'll need to shed load anyway. So uh, depending on the system, and really, uh, the, the way I see to do it is that there's no good way. If there's an obvious way, then I don't need to tell you. And if it's not an obvious way, then I'd probably need to look at your application to give a general tip. It's not something, it's either obvious or not at all, which is kind of shitty, but that's how it is. Any other question? Yeah? So I don't know about the development of the CPP. Could you elaborate a bit more on the end-to-end -end principle? Uh, I don't know all the details because that happened before I was born. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but basically, uh, with, with TCP, there was a, a bunch of um, custom or, let's say, in-house network protocols and whatever that were developed in the 60s and 70s and whatnot. And there was a paper about uh, arguments about system, uh, arguments about end to, uh, the, the end-to-end -end argument about system design or something like that. Uh, that was a super interesting paper. 
that basically just looked at things like whenever you're writing uh, something to transfer a file from a computer to a different one, it is of nearly no use to just have every node halfway through the point tell you that the transfer went right. Uh, it is of use to know if it worked in the end with a given hash or a checksum that tells you, yeah, it worked or not. Everything else in between is uh, superfluous or an optimization, basically. Because if you don't have the end-to-end -end check, you have no proof that, let's say, past the network and onto the disk, something didn't go wrong. And if something went wrong after it left the network and went onto the disk, you don't know about it. So the end-to-end -end principle is really about you don't know that it worked until the job is finally done and you got the, the final message about that. And TCP is kind of like that because you have the acknowledgement and the sequential sending and everything that's done based on the end-to-end -end system. Uh, you won't get to be able on your node to send more messages at a time than different things depending on the settings you have. Uh, but yeah, basically you don't have the UDP stuff where messages are received out of order or some of them are missing. You have a system in place that lets you confirm that at the end of the protocol everything is right. But yeah, I cannot go into more details than that because I'm not knowledgeable enough about it. Okay, so uh, Kenji asked for people who are watching a recording uh, if I have examples about that kind of stuff uh, being implemented in Erlang. Uh, there is one example of back pressure that's implemented in Erlang, and if you watched uh, Lucas Larson's presentation from Erlang Solutions about how the schedulers in Erlang work, uh, you will see that whenever you're sending something to a TCP buffer, or a, rather a port process or whatever, you're sending something to a port, and that the port buffer gets full, the Erlang VM will deschedule your process until the buffer has free space again. And if you don't do that, the process just won't run again. So that's back pressure applied to your process directly to force it not to generate data that won't make to the network. In some cases, that may cause problems because you don't want to get that back pressure because you're yourself victim to it. And uh, you have to deal with that, and that's something that we did with PO Box at some point. Uh, but yeah, that's one example of something that's like that in OTP. I think that uh, the telecom industry in general has been aware of these principles for a very, very long time. And that explains why the MEMSOP, CPUSOP, and all these applications are already in the node. Uh, I'm guessing that a lot of systems that the uh, teams that Ericsson develop have these kinds of things in mind. And if you're writing any kind of system, it's really system dependent, uh, you will get a limited amount of resources. Maybe there are going to be cache registers that you know exist in hardware stores or in brick and mortar stores in the world, and you can put limits on them. But outside of that, directly in OTP, I don't know uh, how many of them exist. I think more or less it's about the implicit uh, control flow that you have with Gen Server Call and that kind of stuff. Yep. Yep. Does who the sender know about that? No. The sender doesn't really know about whether you're dropping the oldest or the newest one. Uh, when you're load shedding, the sender, the, the sender doesn't know when it was dropped. It might just know that it was dropped. Uh, the, p the person who knows is the user or the end user that receives the data. And you may tell them, I dropped that many messages because I could not handle them. But usually, it's none of the business of the sender to know whether it was dropped earlier or later than something. Uh, that's really something that the consumer cares about, not the producer most of the time. Is that it? All right. Well, thanks. <laughs>